Good afternoon and welcome to the final seminar of the first day of the festival. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Go Viral. They were here last year to shed some light on one of the hottest buzzwords, viral marketing. Their speech was so well received that we invited them back this year to give us a deep dive into the changing media landscape and the impact on user-driven marketing. They call it from media feudalism to media you crazy. And I hope you are as eager as I am to understand what's hidden behind these words. Please give a warm welcome to Go Viral's chairman, Jimmy Mayman. Thank you very much, Steve, and uh, welcome to all of you. Um, as Steve said, we were here last year and uh, we talked a lot about viral marketing. This year we're going to try to take it one step back and, and look at the overall arching things that are really impacting the way we do uh, marketing these days. So what I will try to do today is talk to you about uh, something we call media federalism and then show you how we think it, it's moving into mediocrity. Our agenda um, for today, I'm going to talk a bit about last year because I think it's important to put things in perspective. Then I'm going to work a bit on this concept that we're talking about. And in the end, I'm going to try to uh, frame some of the practical solutions that we've worked with and try to work you through some of them. In order to start all this up, I want to share something with you that I think pretty well frames what we're up against these days. It's a little clip, and uh, enjoy it. No one would have believed in the closing years of the 20th century that our most popular media were being watched in a new way by a force that was quietly gathering strength. With blind confidence, we considered them our own, our audience, our subscribers, our cuddly couch potatoes. With infinite complacency, we blithely segmented and sold them to advertisers. We learned to shape their habits, mold their desires, and give them the illusion of infinite choice. Yet from their side of the screen, with envious eyes, they studied us. And bit by bit, they learned and linked and drew their plans against us. Wielding weapons we ourselves provided. And then, early in the 21st century, came the great unraveling. We offered free choice, but all they heard was free. We devised more powerful, more complete, more feature-rich software, but they preferred to grow their own. They pounced, and they blogged, and they blew the house down. The world we knew was forever disintermediated, whatever that means. They have tasted power, and there are a lot more of them than there are of us. High inside our glass towers, our greatest minds prepare to respond. Well, uh, can't we just start blogging back at them? Well, yeah, but where's the money in that? So, as you can see, um, it seems like these consumers that we work with every day, that they're up to something. And really what we're going to talk about today is trying to find out what it is they're up to and, and how we can work with that. What we're up against right now is something of a paradigm shift. It's the first time in, in media history that we've really seen the audience as an active participant in what we are working with, the commercial, the ads. And that's a big change from where they came from. We used to work with an audience that was sitting quite passive behind the screen um, watching our ad breaks. It, that's not the truth anymore. That's not happening anymore. People are much more active. They want to take part. And of course, that's going to have some implications on the way we work with advertising. One of the big things when we were here last year is YouTube. And I'll try not to mention it too many times today because I think people mentioned it so many times last year. YouTube really is the new broadcaster in the online space. If you look at it, um, they've achieved in a very short time span a lot of the things that 
what we grew up with MTV achieved on, during a lot, lot longer time space. So these guys, they're basically changing the media picture as we, as we understand it. They're basically changing the way we do things. If you look at the amount of people that streams the video on a daily basis, the amount of uploads, there's no doubt that, that this thing has changed the way we work with advertising and it will keep changing the way we work without advertising. The key thing here though is YouTube is just one among a lot of opportunities. When we were here last year, we talked a lot about ball marketing because that was really the buzzword last year. I want to kind of take one step back and, and talk a bit about that today as well because I think one of the things that we see a lot out there is that people still think because you have YouTube out there, it's quite easy to create you know, viral campaign, create buzz. But it is actually more difficult than just creating an ad and uploading it to YouTube. It takes more if you want to create a real spread. The reason for that is the facts that I just showed you. Uh, every, on any given day, there are 65,000 people uploading content to that channel, which means that your content, unless it's really outstanding or perhaps even a cam line winner, will perhaps disappear. So really, what we are seeing is that there's an explosion of niche channels, of a lot of channels that we can use in new and interesting ways, but we need to work with them. We need to understand the audience and kind of understand how we serve content up to them in order for, for them to actively engage in it and work with us as, user, as users to drive the advertising that we're working with. This is a, an example on the explosion in web blocks. That's not the only explosion we're seeing. There's the same kind of explosion in, in small and medium site, uh, sites. So, so there's, there's a lot of new niche ch channels appearing and happening out there. And, and that's really what's changing the media picture on, on that side of the equation. What, what you really should consider, uh, as I said, is YouTube, as you can see here, there's a lot of players out there. YouTube is one of the players. It's a big one, yes, but there's a lot of other players. And at the end of the day, what you really want to look for here is kind of the people that really gather around interest and not just to be entertained. If you're able to identify those people and actually go in and do some what we call narrow casting, then you have a much bigger chance of seeing the spread on the user-driven campaigns that you're creating. So really, it's about identifying those niche channels in order to have the spread that you want in a, in a campaign. If you look at, one of the, I think, one of the more clever things that have come out uh, during the last couple of years, uh, it's not from an advertising guy, but from a guy that really understands technology well and also where people are going. Uh, Chris Anderson, uh, talking about the long tail, um, really, he is saying exactly this, not in our line of business, but it will have an implication on our line of business, which is also the reason why I brought him here today. So really, the state of chaos that we are seeing is really happening because we have a very fertilistic approach in the traditional media space. You know, if you look at a campaign, people used to be able, if you run one campaign across uh, Europe, it, it would be quite easy to find a couple of big uh, TV networks and then get it on them, and then you know you'd be able to reach a broad audience. That's not true anymore because, as you saw in the beginning, people are migrating. They're migrating to all these kind of niche channels, and that's kind of led to what we call chaos disruption. Bob Garfield talked a lot about chaos 2.0. I'm sure a lot of you've read some of his things there. And basically what we are trying to do then is trying to frame what we then see as the media democracy, a state where the user is taking the, the much more active role and playing with us when we create those, campaign, those campaigns. So media fertilism, just to frame some of the things in, in, in that, is basically, as you can see, the guy strapped in the chair in front of the TV. That's actually kind of, if you look at the media cynicism that we're seeing out there, that's how many consumers are seeing it today. And that's obviously something that we have to work with and work around if we really want to keep their attention and keep them interested in what it is that we're serving up to them. I think uh, Microsoft framed it uh, quite well earlier this year when they created the, this commercial that I'm going to share with you. Uh, so. 
look at it for a second. Hey there. Long time no see. Looking good. Yeah. Let's just keep this simple. I want a divorce. What now? I think you heard me just fine. Come on. This is me. What's wrong? We don't talk anymore. I just put down a mill on a TV commercial just to talk to you. Exactly. You do all the talking. I never get a chance you to talk on our website, can't you? Sure. If I want to say, order this product. See? It's not exactly a dialogue. What about the print campaign, hmm? You can't tell me you missed the billboard in Times Square. That was like a 200-foot-tall declaration of love. You're saying you love me, but you're not behaving like you love me. It's not genuine. I don't know. The agency said I was genuinely being funny. Genuinely being charming. They said you would love everything I did. You keep your voice down? You're not doing a radio commercial. Look, whether you're funny or not, it's just I've changed. And you haven't. I mean, we don't even hang out in the same places mm. anymore. You're not even listening, are you? Coupons. You want coupons, don't you? Look, come by the store. I got two words for you. Loyalty, reduction. Am I right? That was it, wasn't it? Let's just hug. If you knew me, you'd know I don't care about that. Know you? Sweetheart, I know everything about you. You're 28 to 34. Your online interests include music, movies, and laser hair removal. You have a modest but dependable disposable income. Am I the only one not getting the problem here? I'm out of here. Oh, come on. Don't be like that. Oh, I'll tell you what. Come back here tomorrow. I'll give you the chance to win a Bahamas vacation. I, I hope that you haven't had too many of those conversations with your partners because uh, I think, you know, with that approach and if we keep going like that, there's no doubt that it would be extremely difficult for us to create eff effective campaigns for our clients. So there's no doubt that we need to change. Um, there's also evidence that we need to change. Um, this is a look at the declining network share. Um, as you can see, the gray line network share is really declining heavily. And at the same time, multi-channel penetration is, is growing. You know, the, the smaller, the more segmented channels are really moving fast forward. That's not only happening on the TV side. That's also what we see on, on the di digital side, on the online side. More interesting, perhaps, is that if you look at it, at the, this is from the stage, some of the top-rated TV shows. Um, there's a declining audience to, to those top shows. You know, so in the old days when you had I, Lo I Love Lucy, it would be quite easy to, you know, reach a lot of people if you put an ad either in the front or the back of, of that show. But as you see today, you know, take a show like CSI, which is the top rated this year, uh, it would be extremely difficult to get the same kind of reach. So there's no doubt that we have to consider how we get those people back and how we get you know, the ads and the stuff that we live from selling in front of people. In terms of the networks, I would even say, or perhaps even be a bit provocative, you know, is it a death spiral? You know, the audience is declining, advertising is declining because of that obviously, which means less money for production, lower quality of the shows, which obviously keeps going. Uh, people really today, when they have the opportunity to actively uh, search and, and find what they want to see, they, they want good content. And if we are not able to provide them with good ads and good contents, then they're going to go somewhere else because it's only one click away. So really on the user side, things are really changing. And if you look at it, if you look at, you know, this is the same guy. Um, he could be a gamer, a student, a footballer, an iPad buyer, an entertainment seeker. And, you know, all those roles, that's one guy. You know, it, as, as the guy in the Microsoft ad said, you know, it, he's not necessarily between 28 and 44. Uh, really what's interesting here is his behavior, his roles. And then linking that with the different platforms, the different channels that he's navigating in. Because at the end of the day, that's kind of where we want to reach him. We want to reach him during his uh, daily life and where it fits in his daily life. That's really, I think, the big change. So really what we're seeing is we're seeing a fragmentation in the audience. 
we're seeing that people are divided, which means that they want a more personalized experience. And then this whole media convergence. Um, it's, as we said last year, we talked a lot about viral because suddenly we had broadband across Europe and it, you were able to share uh, pretty interesting high-res stuff with, with the users. But that's going to move into mobile. You're going to have digital television. There's going to be a lot of new platforms that we can play on with, with the stuff that we're used to working with. So it's going to be a, a whole new landscape. And it's, I think, very interesting, but also perhaps a bit scary for people that are that, not that fam familiar with, with those kind of platforms. So really, to, to kind of summarize some of the photorealistic approaches, you know, the network they used to, you know, you were able to reach a lot of people, a lot, a big audience to a couple of big networks in, in the past. And, and the niche media, they didn't really play a role. So that's really uh, the photorealistic state. That's really how that worked. And that's really where we see the big change. So then that moved into what we call the chaos. The user, as I said, they're becoming extremely cynical about things, as you can see here. Uh, they're extremely upset about some of the ads and some of the shows that we put in front of them. And that's obviously one of the reasons why they've moved on to some of the online channels and are now um, surfing more there than they are on the, on the TV set. So according to Bob Garfield, that is basically what he's, he's calling KS 2.0, you know, that the old model is, is collapsing. Um, the reason why it's collapsing, I think, and, and what's coming instead of it, that's really the interesting part. And I think if you look at what's collapsing and what's coming instead, um, you would expect some of the big ad networks, some of the big media networks to kind of step in here and, and play a, a very important role. But if you've looked at the media during the last five, six months, it's basically, you know, it's some of the technology players that suddenly move into this space. They're suddenly taking a stand. And, uh, you know, no, just a year or two years ago, it wouldn't make much sense to, to bring this clip that I'm going to show you now from Eric Schmidt from Google, because you know, what would they know about advertising? But suddenly, they're an important player, which is obviously the reason why I want to share his point of view on why they went into the double quick acquisition, because that has implication on what we're going to work with and how we're going to work we in the future. We decided uh, over the last couple of years to try to offer a full-scale set of advertising services, not just text ads. So in doing the strategic analysis, we looked at text ads, display ads, banner ads, as you know them. Uh, we looked at radio, bought a company there. Television, we're doing a series of trials there. Uh, acquired YouTube, partly because of the end user phenomena, which is extraordinary, and we're very satisfied with that, but also because it's obvious that online video will have a significant advertising component. You, you put all that together, and you go, you think, what would the advertising customer like? Well, what they would like is they'd like a single way in which they can see ads, and then have the computer do the allocation for them. Advertising is really about relevance. It's really about efficiency. It's really about measurability. Um, and there's not been a lot of technology applied to advertising over the last 10 or 20 years, except for a, a few companies, DoubleClick being one of them. What was interesting about DoubleClick is that since 2004, uh, they've made a lot of changes to the way they operate. They're more targeted. They have better tools. And many, many companies are very, very happy with their products. So when we looked at the business analysis, we thought that the combination of the uh, targeting that they do, the advertising support tools that they build, the publisher support tools they, do, they, they build, combined with Google's technology would produce a better experience for the end user. So what we've, what we've said, and of course we've been saying this since Friday night, is that the user will be happier because they'll get a more targeted ad that will be faster to load. The advertiser will get more efficiency, more measurability, more targetability out of the combination. Uh, the publisher will get more reach, especially globally. Mm -hmm. So it's a, the math works is the important point. For sure the math works for, for, for Google. And even more importantly, I think you know, what's important here is that they're suddenly entering a whole new area, an area we used to own and, and work with. But, but really, the reason why they can do that is because if we have to find and identify those guys that are now spending time on a site with only a couple of thousand people, then we need technology. Without technology, we can't do this. It's simply impossible. And that's obviously the reason why they make a move here now. They're paying, as you will see, a lot of money to make that move. And they're not the only ones that are making that kind of move. Uh, double click, yes. Uh, we talked about that. Microsoft also wanted to be part of this game. 
So suddenly you have two players that we didn't consider uh, a competitor last year uh, entering our business and paying a lot of, a lot of money to come into to this business. Yes, WBP also tried to do an acquisition, but as you can see, it's a different ball game and, and a different kind of money that they're paying for it. Um, I want to. I do think that WBP they have seen the light and they know where it's going. So I want to share a clip uh, from CNBC with you because uh, Sir Martin Sol speaks very interestingly about how he looks at this. I'm sorry about the quality of the clip. It's not so much. The, that you should look at, but more what he's saying. That's really the important thing. Tell me first, uh, as we kick it off with you, what was so attractive about 24-7 Media? Why the acquisition and why now? Well, um, what I think we've seen over the last few years is a, is a change in our business. We've moved from uh, focusing on big ideas, on big creative ideas, to uh, media planning and buying over the last five to ten years, and in the last five years, uh, the technology side of our business has become uh, very important, or the application of technology. So if you put it all together, it's not only about uh, big creative ideas or media, it's now about the application of technology to our business as we try to reach consumers on behalf of our clients through the internet, through mobile, uh, and other alternatives and other developments that we'll see. So putting that together made 24-7 uh, a, a very attractive proposition. It's now about the application of technology to our business. Uh, we're not the only one that thinks so. So Martin thinks so as well, which I think is, uh, you know, there's a reason for that, and which is also the reason why he bought 24-7. The, the problem as we see it and the things that are really changing now is that the price of entry into this area, you know, if we really believe that technology is going to drive these things, is increasing. And as you can see, the, the amount of money that players like Google and Microsoft are paying are huge, and it's going to be extremely difficult for the traditional players to keep that pace because they don't have the same kind of money. You know, the valuations in media and advertising are very different. We are not in the same kind of growth business as these guys. So there's no doubt that these guys will play a role in our life. The question is how fast is it going to change things? Um, there's another thing that's important here which is that these guys are not doing it because of the 7 or 8% of global ad spend that are now in the digital space. They're doing it because, as I said earlier, mobile, digital television, everything is going to be digital. Everything is going to be about technology, the technology platform. So that's the reason. You know, that's, what the, that's what these guys are seeing, and that's why they're moving in and paying those kind of hilarious money for, for those kind of assets right now. Sorry. So really what we're seeing is if you look at um, the picture of the players in, in our industry, you have a lot of content providers um, at the lower right hand corner, uh, Time Warner, MTV, those kind of guys. They have content. They do still have audience uh, or some audience. Uh, then you have the more traditional holding companies like WBP. Then you have the technology players. You have Google. You have Microsoft. You have something like SpotRunner. And then you have the more pure play technology players that actually have access already. And of course, what's happening right now that, you know, if you talk about the notion blue ocean, then that's the blue ocean. That's where people want to go. And the reason why they want to go there is obviously because that's where the users are. And the way they're going to do it is with the technology. They want to be able to do the behavioral tracking. And you, you can't do that. You can't operate with millions of people uh, in those kind of matrices. Uh, without having the technology support it. Uh, so, so that kind of real-time deployment and niche targeting demand the technology. So there's no doubt that, that this is going to be extremely competitive in the years to come. So really the implications when we look at the overarching things that we see, then you know, on, the, on the content side, I think when we talk about the advertising agency, I think it's about, you know, Stop thinking about the 30-second ad. The 30-second ad is still going to have a role. Of course, I'm not going to kill the 30-second ad in can. That would be stupid. But, but I think more and more we need to think about content and, and kind of what are the platforms that we go into and how can the content fit those platforms because that's really what it's about. You know, uh, On a mobile, it's not 30 seconds is perhaps not the way. It could be a five second. It could be something else. But you need to think about the content and the format You know that fitting those two things together. 
on, on, I think on the distribution side, you know, it's really, as I said before, it's from broadcasting to narrowcasting. And when you go into that exercise, um, it's really about the technology, you, because without it, it's, it's impossible. And then on, on, on the user side, it, you know, it's, it's, it's actually from consumers to users, it says the opposite here, but it's from consumers to users. It, it's really, you know, those guys are moving, as you saw in the beginning, and, and of course, we need to move with them uh, if we want to stay in business. So really, that takes me into the meteorocracy. You know, suddenly, the user the con that used to be the consumer has moved out. He's empowered. Um, and he will tell us and the broadcaster what it is that he wants to see. And as, as you can see, if you look at, at the stats and all the numbers that are out there, uh, the landscape is changing. Uh, print is decreasing at, at fast pace. Uh, TV is, is still holding on, uh, but it, you know, it will change. And eventually, even I think when we talk about 2010, you know, perhaps it, it would even make sense to talk about TV and Internet because those platforms will merge together. So, so those things will be one and the same because you will have you know, a, new, a new format that you can interact with uh, using the technology and the ways that we work with the Internet. So there's no doubt that these changing media habits, you know, they will, they will need, to, they will push us to change as well. Um, one of the things when we talk about the media landscape and the niche channels um, is influencers. Of course, if you're able to identify environments with influencers, then that's going to have a huge impact on the way you distribute your, uh, your ads and your content. Um, this is an example uh, on, uh, from Technorati on, on blogs. So basically what it shows is that there's a lot of interest to kind of engage and write about things if it, if it gets to people. Uh, here's you know, some of the peaks, Hurricane Katrina. Look at the amount of people that takes the time to have a conversation about that. And really when we talk about communication in general and advertising, I think what it really is about is creating communication, uh, creating, sorry, creating conversations. Um, it is always great if you can create a campaign that creates conversations. And in this space, that's going to be even more important. So really, if you look at what we call the fertile, fertile approach, you know, um, if you have consumers uh, on the vertical and, and the popularity of content on the, on the horizontal, then basically what we're saying is that it used to be like this. You know, you started off, you had a lot of reach because you had some, you had the networks and you had some content that you can push out and people would see it. So basically, and then, you know, at the end you would have reached pretty much everyone. That, that's where we're seeing things are changing and that's where we, you know, I brought in Chris Anderson early on. That's where we're really kind of applying the long tail. Uh, if you have all these niche channels, what it's really about is identifying content and context, you know, so matching those, those two things. So you're able to get the right kind of influencers, the right kind of users on board as early as possible in your campaigns because later as things start to roll, that's going to have a huge implication on the way you're able to reach people. So if you're not, if you're not getting them on board early, then you'd, see, you'd not see the same kind of peaks. So, so that's why spending time on those kind of uh, behavioral studies, behavioral targeting in the beginning is going to have big implications on, on your way to, to execute these kind of uh, campaigns. So really, I think, if we talk about who has the time, the energy, and the passion, you know, there's a reason why Times Magazine put you on their front page uh, beginning of this year. Uh, normally, they take a statesman or they take somebody else, but but this is not something that we are only talking about in here. This is something that you know, popular media is already talking about. So it is out there. It's happening. And the good thing, I think, being here in Cannes, talking about uh, what we should do, the good thing is, is that even though we have media cynicism, you know, there's, still, there's still people out there that think that we should, uh, we should serve up ads or content to them when it's relevant. Really coming back to this again, relevance. So, so you know, that's really one of the positive things. People do appreciate ads when they're relevant. One of the things, you know, we talk about a lot of these things, you know, does it actually work? You know, we, 
earlier this year we did a campaign together with Quicksilver and within the first couple of months it created you know, 14 million of, of, of views, which is obviously a lot in a channel like this. If you've read about it in the news, there was the Dell Health story. Uh, there was a problem with their batteries. You know, one guy started a block, 10 million people saw it, and then the batteries were removed. So Speed Bandits is about you know, traffic limits. You know, nine and a half million people looked at it. Peter on YouTube, Peter is 79 years old, and, and within the first two weeks, you know, when he started to talk about his life, what he was doing, pretty down-to-earth stuff. Almost 16,000 people signed up to it. So, you know, there's no, you know, last one, Nissan. Nissan, uh, another campaign, launch campaign that they did, you know, more than 14 million people engaged in the material and worked with it. I'm going to get back to Nissan as, a, as an example later in my presentation. Goodyear, again, you know, there are people out there, and if you activate them the right way, they'll get engaged in the material. So really, there's a lot of examples of, of very successful user-driven cases out there. These were just some of them. So really, I think, when we look at the mediocrity, really, to summarize what it is, is the networks are really losing power. Uh, they're still going to be important, but they're losing power, especially launching campaigns. Launching campaigns is in our opinion, not necessarily the best way to do it with the networks. But using the niche media in order to get the uptake on, on the campaigns, that's really where we see things are going. And that really leads me into um, the more practical thing in my presentation, which is uh, a bit more about how do we then apply these things and how do we work with them. Um, content, audience, and distribution. Um, as you can see, this is what we've just been talking about. Uh, that we kind of keep pushing stuff at people and, and they don't really like it. They're getting, as I said, extremely cynical about it. I want to just briefly talk about some of the traditional marketing model and then see what, what, how I see they are changing. Um, advertising agency, a creator, media agency, buying planning, uh, public relation, opinion ma manager and maker, media, distribution, consumer, of course consumer, and the ad the message as the carrier. I think one of, one of the reasons that is getting more and more complex and uh, also difficult to navigate here is because there's going to appear a lot more roles. There's going to be the creator, there's going to be the deal maker, there's going to be the facilitator, the distributor, the user, how you're going to rank the content, um, advice on purchase, editor, commentator, tester, comparison, advisor, carrier. There's going to be a lot more roles in this new environment that as you can see, and there's going to be a new player, the tech provider. So, so, so kind of all these new roles, somebody needs to take these, these roles and, and play with us in order to facilitate successful uh, projects in, in this environment. So really, Eucrasy, as, as we're seeing it and I'm talking about it, we see it, it's affecting the traditional decision model. Um, it's still, you know, if you look at it, you know, when we do advertising and do communication and do marketing, it's still about sales and revenue. I think at least that should be the end goal for everything we do. And it, it still is. And if that is the case, then of course some of the things that, that we've been used to uh, also have to change. Um, if you look at the more traditional uh, purchase model or AIDA model, uh, from awareness to sale you know, could take a week, a month, a year. It could take a long time, whereas when we talk about uh, in the pull environment, in the user-driven environment, it's, it's a much more rapid model, a much faster model, and a model where, of course, we need to appear many, many more places if, if we want them to pick up the product that we advertise for. So really, if I look at it, you know, speed is happening. You know, it, it's going from days to minutes. Um, let me give you an example. Um, just last week, I was trying to buy a headset, and um, I don't know too much about headsets, so I started looking online. Um, then I found something that it looked quite interesting. Then I needed some reassurance. I looked at some blogs. I needed to, you know, who's rating this? Who's telling me that this is actually a product that's really outstanding and worth the money? Then after that, you know, then compare with a couple of more, make a pre-selection, shortlist, and decision, all in seven minutes all in seven minutes. You know, that's quite different than what we've been used to. And of course, that's changing 
a lot the way we work with, with consumers, with ads, and with marketing. And really the key thing here, I think, is trying to bridge all these phases and try to be where the consumer are when they're looking for these kind of things. So really, because if you look at it, um, even though we have technology, technology has also given us um, a lot of more choices. So, uh, so it's more complex if you look at it. If, if that's my op opportunity set of headsets, you know, there's a lot of headsets out there. And if you don't know a lot about it, it's, it's quite difficult. So basically, I think what it's about, it's we need to help these people navigate. And we need, you know, we need to make sure that the brand that we are advertising have a role when these decisions are being made. Um, and I think that's where there's not too many people today there that are doing a great job. I think that's where we can do a much better job. And, but we can only do that if we, if we use the technology and understand how to use the technology. So really, media advertising and the sales process are really coming together and merging. Um, and I think you know, the allocation of budgets in the future, I think, should be more based on, on the consumer behavior patterns and purchase patterns, because you know, that's where the consumers are. And at the end of the day, that's how we should, as I see it, allocate our money. So really, creating the transparency, you know, making it simple, making sure that we take the hand of the consumer and take him from, from the awareness and interest and all the way through the sale, because there's so many, way, there's so many places and so many intersections where, it, where he could actually drop out and where it could go wrong. Just an example, behavioral targeted strategies. Uh, on, if we just pick on one of them, if we just say you know, the selection process, online PR to 5,000 5, opinion makers. You know, that, that's one example on, on how, you can, you know, how we can harness, how we can help in the selection process, making sure that we have identified the right kind of blogs, the right kind of forums that actually are talking about our product. So when, when you know, the consumer goes there, that he's reassured. So just one example on, on how this could work. There's, as you can read, there's, there's other ways. But I think that is really what it comes down to, finding out what those hooks are, what those things are that can bring our brand to those places. Because at the end of the day, it's still about the brand. It's about, it's about reassurance. And that's what branding, in, in a way, is all about. That leads me into the example that I want to show you. And before I'm talking, I'm going to talk a bit about the example. I'm just going to show you uh, a little um, clip. So, what's all the fuss about? Let's find out. We're switching to all mode 4 mode 4 now.
Okay, so that was an example on a branded universe that we worked on together with the, you know, I just want to make sure that you understand, we don't do content ourselves, we work with, we work with the agencies, and this stuff was, create, was created by TPWA, and, um, and basically what we're doing is then working on the, the whole uh, media side of things, making sure that we actually get it in front of consumers. I think also previously I talked a bit about the Quicksilver campaign, Sachi worked on that, just to make sure that I'm not taking credit for something that we didn't do. Um, really what, what's happening here is, uh, is really, you know, we, we created, an, originally what we did was we created a lot of online PR. You know, we identified the right kind of environments for, for this kind of online PR because what we wanted, what we really wanted to do with this campaign was, was try to get into uh, the skating communities and those kind of communities uh, to get some some hype. Uh, so that was kind of one of the one of the milestones in the project. So we created a lot of online hype and the right kind of blogs, the right kind of forums. We released background uh, material to some of the big car sites. Uh, we created some some mobile pieces that you could download on the mobile. Um, we, of course, what, what we did when the campaign started to roll and we, when we had positioned it well on, on all the more relevant sites, we also uh, put in some, uh, some keywords and search engine optimization because before this campaign hit, hit the, the, the net, you know, no one had heard about Casky. Uh, so, of course, we wanted to make sure that we, when people started looking for these things that we actually directed them the right, to the right places so they could actually interact with the content. And then, of course, to create more awareness, you know, we had, as you saw, there was a lot of material. You know, it was like a small universe of this fake car games universe with a lot of different things. You could see the drivers. There was a lot of things going on there. So it was kind of like a whole campaign from beginning to end where the user was very engaged in the whole story when it unraveled. And, and of course, uh, even though it, it created a lot of awareness, what we also wanted was to make sure that people actually signed up to get more information when the car was eventually ready. Uh, and 50,000 people signed up and, and, and we got more than 1,000 trials in, in that pre-launch phase. And that was even before the car was ready. You know, this whole campaign ran before the car was ready. And another thing that's obviously also important is that a lot of people actually are looking at what it is that you're putting out there. And in this case, a lot of people did look at what we put out there. Uh, as I've said before, more than 14 million people saw it. And as you can see, these are some of the daily activity levels. There will be peaks every time you launch, every time you place new content. If you get it in the right environment, you can immediately see it on the track. And you would immediately see that, you know, okay, here, we hit, we hit a gold mine here. You know, this is really the right place. It's really taking off now. So that's really interesting when you're working with these kind of things, that you can monitor on an hour-by-hour basis or even on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, which is something that we are not used to if we work with traditional TV. So really, when we talk about user-driven media planning and we talk about eucharist, when we talk about all the things that we've talked about today, what it really comes down to is, as we've, as we've said already, is, is behavioral targeting, is identifying the right platforms. And, and this is the way we go around when we work with it. You know, we, when we look at a launch, we always look at, you know, what are, you know, what are the key influencers? What are the key, you know, editors? And how do we get to them? What is the kind of content we need? You know, sometimes it is as simple as a press release, but sometimes it's not. And then we need to find out what that is. A simulation, you, know, you could do contextual, which is basically that there's a fit between what it is that you're working on, the brand, and also the audience, you know, if it's cars and there's only 5,000 people on a certain car sites, then, you know, it's a good match. It's only 5,000 people, but if you have enough of those kind of environments, then it's fantastic and the campaign will grow. Um, then later on, you can go more broadca broadcast and you can use bro broader sites like YouTube. Uh, the same with mobile marketing. Uh, as I said, keywords and search, very important in this space. You really need to understand how you make them part of your campaign. And then, of course, mass media. Mass media still has a role. Of course it has a role. This is not that mass media is going away. As I said before, only 7 or 8% of, of spending right now is in, in digital. It is moving, but there's still a lot of things happening in, in, in the broadcast environment and mass media. And, of course, these things still need to be linked together, and that's extremely 
important. And if you think about the Nissan Qashqai, if you think about some of the stuff I showed you that we did in the online context here, and then if you've seen uh, the, the mass media version, which is basically uh, a guy skating on the car, so those kind of things also match pretty well together. So basically, those, those are the things. That's really what I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, I, I hope that you enjoyed our little presentation and you have a better idea about what we frame, Eucracy. And uh, I want to wish you uh, a very good week here in Cannes. And uh, if you have any questions, be more than uh, welcome to send them to me. Thank you very much.